I'm Reverend Art Ritter, along with my wife, Laura. I am pleased to be here this morning, grateful to be part of your service of worship. Uh, you can read all about me in your bulletin insert, so I won't go into that at all, but I just will mention that I'm glad to be part of your sabbatical experience. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is Please stand and join me in a call to worship. Come, let us worship and praise God. Celebrate the many ways in which God cares for our lives. Even though difficulties happen in our lives, still God is with us. Surely God's mercy accompanies us on our journey. Our opening hymn is number 431, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Community, you may be seated. And now I will light the sabbatical candle. May we trust in God's grace to sustain us all for this 40-day sabbatical journey. May we trust the Lord to watch over our congregation and Pastor Sarah while we are absent one from another. May God renew us and inspire us during this special time. Our first reading this morning is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And now a moment for the whole family of God. I brought some friends today. Um... Today is Mother's Day. My mom passed in 2001. But uh, I remember much from her and carry a lot with her each and every day of my life. I had a blanket when I was a a child. And I had took it everywhere with me and probably got embarrassing for my parents. But my mom was pretty clever because every time she washed it, she cut a piece off the blanket. And gradually my big blanket became about this big. And then one day it disappeared. When my blanket disappeared, I inherited these. Spot. Spot has his nose chewed off. I must have been really hungry. And this is Montgomery, the lion. And these were the things that kept me comfort and provided me with with love and, and security and insurance. When I had trouble sleeping at night when I was a child. I took the problems and cares of childhood with me and snuggled close to Spot and Montgomery much as I did my blanket. On Mother's Day, we we celebrate that kind of love that we receive from from others in our lives, from family members or those we we love outside of our families. And it is the love of God that is there, the assurance that we are loved, we are accepted, we are cared for, we are capable, we are wonderful people. It is God's love and our mothers we celebrate today, but it is God's love that is there for us this day and every day. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for your love which comes to us in so many ways. Today we celebrate it in the love we receive from our mothers. We know that it is with us in the dark and stormy nights. We know that it is close by us whenever we call upon it. We give thanks for your love. And we pray that we might share of that love with those around us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Join in the uh, student standing song. Even though we don't have any students to send, but we can still send our voices up to the heavens. Thank you for that special music. 
Our second reading today is from Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 17, and you can find that in your Pew Bible on page 871 if you would like to follow along. The great multitude in white robes. Remember, Paul or John is writing this. After I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. This is the word of the Lord. It is a joy and an honor to be with you this morning. I, I have a little bit of an attachment with this church, even though I've only been here twice now. I'm a friend and grateful colleague of Pastor Sarah. I've known and enjoyed the friendship of uh, Tom and Wendy Van Tassel for a long time now. In the uh, summer of 2020, in the midst of a pandemic, it was a privilege for my church, Meadowbrook Congregational Church in Novi, to share in a book study with First Congregational Church of Saugatuck. So some of you have seen my face and heard my voice before via the magic of Zoom. So I know, about, I know a little bit about you and my prayers are with you in this time of sabbatical. sabbatical. I'm here also this morning as a representative of the National Association of Congregational Christian Churches. I currently am the vice moderator and the chair of the board of directors. I have the honor of serving with Tom Van Tassel on the board of directors. So I bring with me greetings from our sister churches. I thank you for your support of our National Association in time and in money and in prayer. In a few short weeks, I will be the moderator of the association, and I know that during the rest of this month you will have the honor of hearing from our executive director, Ashley Cook-Clear, and our current moderator, Cindy Bacon-Hammer. They will be uh, preaching for you uh, during the weeks ahead. So this morning I feel a little bit like John the Baptist preparing the way for those who will follow me. I've been retired from Meadowbrook for just a little over a year now, and people ask me, what have you enjoyed most about your retirement? I think they're expecting me to say, not having to write a sermon, or maybe not having to get up early on Sunday morning, or not having to get to the building and, and open it up each and every Sunday morning. But I think I discovered my true answer again uh, yesterday as I was packing and preparing to come here. I most enjoy figure, not having to figure out what I have to wear on Sunday morning. I don't mind not having to pick out the shirt and suit and tie each and every Saturday night. Thankfully, Laura helped me yesterday as I was packing. Evangelist Billy Graham once told a story about he arrived in this small rural town to preach. And this was early in his career before he became a very famous evangelist and world-renowned preacher. Once he arrived at the town, he wanted to mail a letter. So he noticed a young boy walking down the street, and he asked this young boy for the location of the post office. 
The boy quickly and cheerfully told him, and Graham thanked him, and then he added, If you want to come to the Baptist church tonight, you'll hear me preaching, and I'll be telling everybody about how to get to heaven. Well, the little boy was silent. He looked down at the ground for a bit. Then he lifted his head and responded, I don't think I'll be coming to hear that, mister. You don't even know how to get to the post office. <laughs> a couple of years ago, I was visiting an elderly woman in my congregation who was in hospice care. She was near death. She was very aware of her circumstances. And after a brief conversation and a word of prayer, I prepared to make my leave. And she suddenly grabbed my hand and she looked into my eyes and in her weak voice she whispered, Art, can you tell me what heaven's going to be like? I was caught a little off guard. Never having been there, I couldn't offer her any tourist recommendation. But obviously this question was important for her at that very moment. <clears throat> and so using any kind of wisdom I could manage, I threw the question back at her and I said, What do you think? heaven will look like. This was an unforgettable moment because suddenly her eyes lit up and she began to speak with a, a stronger voice and renewed vigor and she talked about how she thought heaven was going to be like her garden with flowers and warm breezes and blue sky. And she talked about seeing her departed husband and siblings and parents once again. And then she mentioned she, she thought she'd be young again that her body would be free from pain and disease. And then a, a smile crossed her face. And I was really impressed. I told her, I thought she was right. That must be what heaven is going to look like. And with that, she smiled again. She squeezed my hand. And she fell off to sleep. If there's a heaven, what will it look like? Like my parishioner, there's lots of things about heaven that I'd like to know. Are we in the bodies we have now? Are we in better looking bodies than the one I see when I look in the mirror? Will I be able to run faster, jump higher, without hips and knees aching? Will I recognize others? Will my mother be there waiting for me to show me around and make me feel at home? Will I be encouraged to greet others who might follow me? Will heaven be only for humans? Or will our beloved pets be there wagging their tails when they see us? Will there be baseball in heaven? I really think so. But will the Detroit Tigers field a better team than the New York? About 10 years ago, USA Today had an article with some really interesting statistics. It said 67% of all adults in the United States believe that there is a heaven. 67%. This didn't surprise me. Maybe I thought it'd be a little higher. But strangely enough, the article went on to say that only 67% believe in heaven, but 88% were certain they were going to heaven. I don't know what that says about the 21%. 21% certain of a destination that they didn't believe in. Long ago, St. Augustine said, it's easier to say what some things are not than it is to say what some things are. And I think heaven kind of fits that particular description he gave. All of us know about heaven in words and in mind pictures that are beyond our words, but there's really not a concrete description anywhere the Bible's not really helpful. There aren't a whole lot of heavenly details there. There aren't physical descriptions upon which we base our hope. All of that stuff about pearly gates and, and streets of gold and angels playing harps are all post-biblical traditions. Maybe we believe heaven to be a physical destination, a place of light where our bodies and souls travel after death. Or maybe we believe simply in this post lightman idea that heaven is perhaps a, a spiritual metaphor for a wonderful place. If we search for answers, we certainly might not find a whole lot. We'll find a lot of opinions, though, and a lot of feelings. In thinking about heaven, it seems as if all the talk of specifics is really beyond the point. 
Heaven is a, a larger, deeper reality that transcends our current physical existence and our limited human thought. The lectionary readings today come from what is known as Good Shepherd Sunday. We heard the 23rd Psalm. The Gospel passage today speaks of Jesus as the Good Shepherd. And then there's this reading from the book of Revelation that I have chosen for us to contemplate. It paints a picture of a future time, a time in which God dwells with all of humanity, when God will have God's way with all of the world. The author witnesses this great multitude that surrounds the throne of God. They're all wearing bright, shiny white robes, enabled by the power of Jesus Christ to be there safely, securely. The faithful who have endured life's hardship now find eternal reward through the power of God in Jesus the Christ. There's no more hunger, no more thirst. The sun doesn't shine, or the sun shines, but it doesn't burn. Springs, water of life flow. God is there to wipe away every single tear. There's a certain assurance that all is well and all will be well from that time forth. God's way will prevail. Well, as difficult as a description of heaven might be, I cannot help but think about heaven when I read these words of vision from Revelation. I see quite a few heavenly affirmations here. This cloud of, of people gathered in bright, shiny robes remind me of, of those who have gone before me and who have taught me well and have witnessed a faith to me. I expect them to be there. I find hope in the writer's description, this intense, permanent, eternal communion with God. No matter what heaven might look like, it helps to know that it is an everlasting home with God. While here on earth we might find God in maybe momentary glimpses, on, in heaven God will be everywhere, in everything, all the time. I find heaven to be a place where God's will is visible, undeniable, real. While much in our world is false and cruel, all of heaven is true. And all gives life. In heaven, earthly wrongs are set right. In heaven, evil and injustices are no more. In heaven, we don't have to worry about our fair share. In heaven, we don't have to be concerned with paybacks. In heaven, we don't have to be afraid of monsters and, and dark terrors. We find in some righteous way that God has taken care of all of the wrongs of the world. In a way that leaves all at peace. Next, I think that while on earth we believe in, in, in putting on pretenses, struggling with temptations to, to compromise and to be something other than ourselves, in heaven we'll find the life that God has intended for us all along. Sometimes we spend our days trying to impress God with self-righteousness or, or trying to impress others by winning the game of life. In heaven we'll find ourselves cheerfully accepting God's love, God's acceptance. God's forgiveness. We will at last be who we really are and we can rest in the peace of our own authenticity. With the assurance of such a heaven, we can now live out earthly life pursuing God's way, not our own way. Our life on earth is not supposed to be a contest to be better than other people or a quest to be approved by other people. It is a search to be God's person in this time with the assurance of God's love. Even as I read this passage, there's a lot I don't know, certainly nothing I can prove. I believe God's grace makes heaven a rather surprising place. The old joke is that when we get to heaven, we'll be shot first by who's not there, next by who is there, and finally by the fact that we are there. I believe in the boundless mercy of God, Jesus speaks of God's love as that of a shepherd who will not stop searching for one lost sheep, or of a woman who won't stop sweeping her, her house until she finds the lost coin. From this, I think that God will have a way even for those who might steadfastly stay in the dark. I don't know how, but I know that God is powerful enough, determined enough to crack the heart of even the worst sinner. 
I trust in the judgment of that kind of God. A few years ago, I remember seeing a program on Nickelodeon. Maybe it was more than a few years ago because my girls were going to be watching Nickelodeon. But it was a reincarnation of an old Art Linklater segment when kids say the darndest things. Any of you remember that, an Art Linklater show? Well, the host asked the children, what do you have to do to get to heaven? Here were some of their answers. Help other people. Go to church every Sunday. Don't ever lie or cheat or steal. And there was one young man who, who seemed to be puzzled by the question and by the answers that other people were giving. And finally, he cut right to, right to the point. How, what do you have to do to get to heaven? You have to die. <laughs> well, we need not and should not be in a hurry to get there. God gives us the gift of life now, the gift of life on this earth, to be together, to learn more about God's faithfulness and grace, to become aware of all of the good that God has created within us, to find joys and ways that help us better define what eternal life with God can be. C.S. Lewis said that the only sure way to avoid heaven is to keep hard at work, to hear no music, and to never look at the earth or sky, or to love no one. I believe in heaven. I believe it to be whatever God would have it be. I believe it to be wherever God might put us. I believe it to be a place in time where I am totally what God wants me to be. I believe it to be a place where I am with God forever. Let us pray. Loving God, on this day in which we remember the love of those in our human families, a day in which we recall the love of Jesus the Christ as shepherd who confidently leads us through life, we remember your promise that we are with you forever. We pray that you will help us to trust in you and to enjoy the gifts of this life as we discover more and more about you. Help us to celebrate your love in ways with one another that reflect what this heavenly vision might be. Help us to be faithful in all things until that day we stand before you to live our eternal lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I would invite you now to stand and we will sing together our hymn of response, number 435, Surely Goodness and Mercy.
And now David Edwards will share a poem with us. This poem is entitled, My Mother and Mary. My mother loves to play in the dirt. She has gray hair and smile lines, but still you'll find her out in the garden like a child on her knees, elbows muddy, hands dirty, smile lines and full flex. I think my mother and Mary would have been friends, for in their darkest days, both have gone to the garden. So I imagine that on their darkest days, both Mary and my mother have willed new life from earth's cold ground, meticulously tending stubborn soil while praying for a miracle, praying that seeds will grow into flowers that will take our breath away and remind us again that we are small. And lo and behold, as sure as the sun rises, those seeds grow, and lo and behold, as sure as the sun rises, those flowers will always take my breath away. And when they do, you'll find my mother out in the garden, elbows muddy, hands dirty, smile lines and full fights, reminding me of Mary, reminding me of God, reminding me of the gift of new life. And I feel small. And it takes my breath away. And my smile lines are in full flex. At this time, I would invite you to offer any uh, prayers joys, concerns that you might carry. Uh, Phyllis mentioned to me that uh, prayers for her family, her nephew Pete, uh, passed away, I believe, at age 25 this week. Prayers for her family. Are there other things that... Yes? Uh, Continued prayers for my mother, Chris. Okay, for Chris. Thank you. Yes? for them as they fight COVID, yes. Lots of hands going up, okay. Prayers for all mothers today who are you know, suffering a premature loss of their, of their children. Prayers for mothers who have lost a child. Yes, someone else back here? Uh, we've come here from England to visit my sister Vivian, who's very unwell, and says Vivian is going up. Your sister Vivian. Thank you. prayers for our world situation. Thank you. Something else back here? Yes. Uh, I did okay. Okay. I invite you to join with me in prayer. Let us pray. God of life and love, we give you thanks for this new day. We're grateful for all the ways your presence is made known to us in both great and small ways. We give thanks for the people and circumstance by which we are reminded of your steadfast love for us and for all people. On this day, as we celebrate your love, we give you thanks for those who have given us life. We acknowledge how often the love of our mothers embodies your steadfast and relentless love. We praise you for the gift of motherly love, both 
gentle and fierce, strong and humble, kind and true. For mothers who live on only in our memories, those whom we miss dearly this day, we are grateful. For mothers who work night and day to care for children, for many who work at this task alone, we pray that we might find ways to assist and uphold. For mothers who have lost their children and must carry on, we ask for your mercy. For women who have longed for but have never had children of their own, we offer prayers for their emptiness, their yearning. For women who have been examples of your love and grace, caring for others in selfless ways, we praise you. For mothers around our world who watch their children suffer from disease or hunger or war. For those who stand for their children against overwhelming forces of violence and oppression. We lift our prayers for their needs, seeking ways that we can respond with gifts of life. We raise to you our prayers for our own needs, for the needs of our loved ones, the needs of our world. We pray for those who are sick, for those with concerns of health, for those who face surgery or treatment or testing. We pray for those who are lost in the darkness of depression, in the pit of sadness, in the swirl of worry and depression. We pray for those who this day face difficult choices and decisions. We are more than exhausted when we hear the news of this troubled world. We pray for an end to war, a beginning to peace in the Ukraine and other places in this planet. We pray, O oh God, that you would move even the most hardened heart to actions that would seek justice and mercy rather than missiles and bombs. We pray for the innocent who this day will deal with the loss of their homes and work and routine of everyday life, knowing that there are so many places where war and violence limit life. We pray for true peace, that we might be peacemakers ourselves. We pray for nations, for our leaders, for a spirit of unity that can be built upon your desire for what is right and what is merciful. We pray for this church, the First Congregational Church of Saugatuck. Bless them during this time of pastoral sabbatical. Bring your spirit upon Reverend Sarah that she might grow in this time. And bring your spirit upon the people of this church that they might grow in their call to be your people as members and friends, as a gathered body. Hear this our prayer and the silent prayers of our hearts and minds and soul. We offer these things in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
the spirit of truth, the truth of God. Because I believe I serve, not as a slave that serves a time, but like farmers reaping the harvest, the truth of Jesus, the spirit of truth, the truth of God. The Lord is a good shepherd. Jesus laid down his life for all. Today we thank God for nurturing our life and sustaining our faith. In gratitude, we bring some of what we have been blessed with to help others to know God's love. Today, may our ears be open to listen to God's voice, our eyes open to see our brothers and sisters in need as sheep of the same flock. May our tithes and offerings give voice to Christ's love for all people. May our offering be a testament of our commitment as a church to be a place for the whole flock of our shepherd God. Let us gather our gifts together and offer them to God in gratitude and praise. God, we ask your blessing upon these gifts which we have brought for use in your service. Bless each giver and bless each gift. Multiply their use as we seek to serve others in this time and in this place. Move our hearts to be greater givers in all that we do and all that we say. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. In sharing the ministry today, I will call your attention to the inside page. One side is some information about our guest speaker today. The other side is a whole slew of announcements of upcoming events. Uh, the most recent or coming is today. We have our little brunch downstairs for coffee hour. Please join us. The Board of Ministry will meet tomorrow night at 6.30, and Women's Fellowship will meet on May 10th at 10 a.m., and we are planning some summer activities, so if you haven't been in a while, women, please come and find out what's going on, because we have some things going on. And then the rest of the list, you'll see our other dates that are coming in the next week and in the future. I also wanted to call your attention to 
some announcements that were in the weekly newsletter. And first of all, I wanted to call your attention to the fact that on Friday night, Jeopardy used congregationalism as a clue. And it was a thousand dollar answer. And I can't think that fast, so I missed it. Somebody else on Facebook posted the question and they knew it right away. So, hooray for congregationalism. <laughs> um, uh, on Friday, May 20th, and Saturday, May 21st, St. Peter's Catholic Church 